and welcome to the Scriptures Are Real podcast. This is the podcast where we talk about elements of the scriptures that have become real to us because we think that when we know that the scriptures are real, we can gain more power as we apply them to our lives, and we need all the power we can get. I'm your host, Kerry Mielstein, and I'm so happy to have with me today my my dear friend and, and really in many ways a mentor and a colleague and everything else, uh, Jeff Chadwick. Uh, who, uh, when I was a student in Jerusalem, was the ancient Near Eastern studies teacher. And both times I've gone back to Jerusalem, he's taught uh, that same course there. And uh, I would say I, I feel like I'm a, a decent um, uh, biblical geographer in the Holy Land, but that's really because I was there with Jeff, who is, uh, if not the best, uh, then one of the best uh, in, in the church. And and uh, what I've learned uh, and abilities I've gained, I've gained from Jeff uh, He's uh, an archaeologist, has been working in Israel for a very long time, uh, did uh, studies both in Jerusalem and at the U, and I don't know what else, but anyway, we'll let him introduce himself, but welcome, Jeff. Thanks for coming on with us. Hey, it's great to be here, Kerry, and um, it, it, it must be the deep voice guys session here. That's right. <laughs> uh, we we always had a good time in Israel together that we could uh, b- boom some bass out to uh, all the students and they could hear us from far away. <laughs> Yeah, we we've spent about three years there together, as I recall, and uh, or yeah. or parts of three different years, and uh, yeah. had a, had great. Well, maybe four if you count the the one assignment. So we've uh, we've been around the block a lot in the Holy Land, and been out to Bethlehem together uh, a dozen times. Yeah. Yep. Out in the shepherd's fields with our families, we've yep. uh, and including on a, a couple Christmas Eves. So. Uh, and, uh, Nazareth and Bethlehem and all the Christmas places. So uh, this is a, a perfect uh, a duo, you and I, to uh, to discuss the chapters of the New Testament that we want to talk about today. Yeah, I, I'm very excited about it. Well, what else should we know about you that uh, that I didn't say? Uh, you teach at BYU in church history and doctrine. Yeah, I've uh, well, I've been around here so long that uh, I've been literally teaching for the church since the 1970s. Um, yeah. I began as a seminary teacher in the 70s uh, up in Weaver County, which is where I still live. Um, did that for much of the 80s while I was doing my graduate work. Uh, after I got a, a master's in 1982, BYU invited me to teach in their program in Jerusalem. They were so hard up for people that uh, <laughs> they, they looked at this uh, this young guy uh, and said, uh, "Come, come teach for us. So I I taught summer uh, terms for them for uh, uh, for about a decade there, till I finished uh, my PhD, and then they took me over there full time for a couple of years. Myself and my very young family, with a brand new baby, our sixth child had just been born when we moved over, and uh, those were the years in the '90s when I got to know you. Yeah. And uh, since then, we've uh, been going back. I taught Institute for uh, several years in the 90s and then decided to move to BYU uh, in their religion um, school and uh, was hired with a a Jerusalem Center component so that I still teach at the Jerusalem Center regularly. And it's a a great privilege to have taught with you there uh, on on four different programs. Yeah. Lots of other good colleagues, and uh, we learn a little bit. I'm a practicing archaeologist. I've excavated at several sites in Israel for many years. Uh, I've yeah, been like three decades, I think. For over 20 years now, I've been at one site called Gath. Yeah. It was the yeah. whole Goliath, so uh, that's a, a long-time assignment. But I worked at Hebron in Jerusalem and Ekron before that. And so we have a, a, a background, you know, of, of Hebrew Bible, uh, New Testament. I started reading the New Testament in Greek on my mission in 1975. Um, and then... Uh, but you served in Germany, right? Am I remembering served right? served in Germany, where all the great scholarship was. Yeah, Got true. kind of carried away by it. And, um, uh, yeah, uh, did Hebrew Bible as well. I took my uh, PhD in, in archaeology, but uh, the minor was Hebrew Bible. And like yourself, Egyptian. So uh, we know yep. we that component. And uh, yeah, I've just been uh, uh, teaching uh, both here in, in our Zion and also in the, uh, the, the Zion of Jerusalem for 42 years now. Wow. So, uh, How many know, semesters have you been at the... Oh. Something. And uh, the, the one thing that, uh, that I'm glad of is that the thing I know about myself more robustly is that 
almost every day I learn something. Yeah, yeah. How many semesters have you taught at the Jerusalem Center? Do you know? Uh, semesters in all, uh, I have to recalibrate because we used to do terms. Oh, you know? yeah. Well, I, I guess programs are so whatever. If, whatever if I took two terms and made them into a semester, it would be a total now of about 21 semesters. So seven full years yeah. of, of three semester years, which is the way we do it there. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's, that's, that's a, lot. a lot of years. Yeah, I'm actually I'm actually up over 25 programs. So, you know, in World War II, uh, when you flew uh, bombers and missions, after 25 missions, they let you go home. <laughs> but I'm hoping they, you know, won't fire me from missions uh, now at the Jerusalem Center. We're scheduled to go back, and glad to be going, and uh, happy to serve. Uh, well, wonderful. And, and uh, I have to say that uh, it was um, my first time teaching in Jerusalem that uh, I started to look at the, the Christmas story. I mean, there, I, there are elements of it that I'd say, OK, I, I'm not so sure I think uh, of it in this traditional way or that traditional way before then. But it was really when you're there celebrating Christmas that you start to to really look at the landscape and the archaeology and you look at it a little bit differently. And since we're covering uh, Luke 2 and Matthew 2 and so on for the, the reading today, and we're actually recording this just a, a few days after Christmas, uh, although this will air uh, later, but uh, when we're covering the Christmas story, so it's perfect that Jeff's got his Christmas tree and Christmas background there. Um, but uh, before we jump in and cover all of this, uh, let's just highlight some of the things we're going to talk about. I think we're going to have enough to say that we'll break this into two episodes and uh, first of all, we'll cover uh, some of how we get the story. Uh, we'll talk, we'll cover some elements from Matthew 1 and Luke 1 about the Annunciation, not so much about the Annunciation of John, but especially about the Annunciation to Mary and to Joseph and what happens between them and the, the stigma that they would uh, deal with and the reasons they would go to Bethlehem and what it would really be like, uh, some of the artifacts and the, the uh, reality of what the the nativity story would have been like and then as we keep moving and and uh, much of this will be in the second uh, episode uh we'll we'll continue with what really happened with the the birth narrative and the shepherds and what it would have been like with the shepherds we will have already at that point talked about the timing uh that we think that this is probably in december uh but we'll we'll talk about the shepherds and then we'll start to explore the story of the wise men and of herod and uh, the flight into Egypt and where they may have been in Egypt, what the timing would have been, how the uh, the killings would have taken place of the innocents. Uh, and I think you'll find that many of the things we talk about will go against some of the things that you've always thought. Uh, sometimes I call this the Christmas Mythbusters kind of episode, but I hope we give you a more realistic picture and a faith affirming picture of the nativity story. Um, but, uh, why, why don't you tell us, uh, you, you helped shape a lot of my, uh, thinking about, uh, how to examine the, the story that's presented in Luke two and Matthew two. And so I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that story. Um, I'm happy to share, but I'll just say, you know, we're, we're now a few days after Christmas, but my Christmas stays up until mid January because for me, that's the Christmas season. Um, yeah. Long ago, uh, becoming aware of other people's um, Christmas traditions, uh, first in, in Germany as a missionary where they have a second Christmas day, and, and then uh, in the Holy Land where Orthodox Christmas comes uh, 12 days after, the, uh, after uh, Western Christmas. Uh, I, I'm just uh, an extend the season person. <laughs> so th this stuff behind me will all stay up until probably pretty close to Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> we love it, and I love the bright lights. And, uh, and um, you know, uh, one thing about archaeology and geography and language and cultural studies is that they, they allow you to get a, a better grip on the context of our scripture story. Yeah, they, they allow us, uh, and archaeology is the study of, of, of human beings of the past um, and uh, in all aspects. And so the, the people in this story, the Savior throughout the New Testament, the prophets throughout the Old Testament, um, but Mary and Joseph particularly, 
in uh, the story of the, the nativity, Matthew 1 and 2, Luke 1 and 2, are, uh, are able to come alive more because you access what life for them was really like. What were the places like where they lived? How did they dress? What did they eat? What was their, their calendar? What were their holidays? What was their work life like? Uh, what language did they speak? Um, you know, I've, I've worked with Aramaic for four decades, and I can now, when I'm reading the New Testament, I can almost hear what they're saying in yeah. Jewish Galilee and Aramaic. And it, it's an amazing thing. It's, it's really goofy sometimes because I'll say something in English uh, rather backwardly, uh, but it's because I'm thinking, you know, in, in Hebrew yeah. or this is switch the, the the subject and the verb order and all those kinds of things and yeah you like to say the scriptures are real and and boy are they yeah um, and that's one that two things i bear witness of and i always do this with the book of mormon but uh, i think it's important to do so with the bible as well uh, that these scriptures are one true but two authentic they are what they claim to be they are uh, ancient records which have been curated and passed down to us and, and translated into languages that we can understand. But they're real. They were written by real people who were often eyewitnesses uh, or, or uh, hearsay witnesses to the events. And um, we're, getting, we're getting the real story. Sometimes it's told from different perspectives and you'll have Luke tell you something and Matthew tell you something else. And, It'll take putting the two of them together to get the whole story, uh, yeah, but yeah. but they're they're reporting accurately. It's an amazing thing, and because it's injected with the spirit of the Lord, uh, these are the most profitable things that we can spend our time with these scriptures. I agree, and, and I, I I think I, I don't know how many of our uh, audience members would be interested in this or not, but for me, as as I study the archaeology, I am amazed at how often not only does it just uh, authenticate the record but it adds uh, a richness to it uh, that just impresses you yet again how authentic that record is oh uh, you know just again, Gary, again. i know this i know this happens to you and it happens to me all the time when i'm reading the scriptures it's almost like um it's it's better than a virtual reality helmet uh, yeah. you are in the setting uh, you can smell the smells. You can feel the breeze blowing. If, and you can feel either the warmth of the air or the chill in the air, depending on what time you're there. You can, you know what's happening in that story. You know what color the flowers are. It, it's an amazing thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I just tell people, you know, uh, put yourself in those scriptures. And the more you learn about them, the more accurately the setting will be that you put yourself in when you study them. Uh, that's perfect. In fact, maybe I'll, I'll share a quick story about that, that I guess I, I should also do a little plug for, um, you know, my youngest son, Jacob, who's 15 now. Yeah. And, I uh, saw what he's doing. Yeah. Yeah. His, his, so his, his grandpa and some of his cousins kind of said, you know, you ought to do your own little YouTube thing for youth to help them see that, uh, a flavor of the scriptures. And so he's started a little podcast. It's short and it's just aimed at the youth uh, called Youth Follow Him. Uh, but I remember, I, I think it was his first one. He did one, to, like he recorded it on the day of Christmas Eve and released it that day to help people with Christmas. But it's one of those moments as a father where you just go, oh, so glad because I remember him saying, um, he was remembering spending Christmas Eve on a, a field, uh, you know, where shepherds would have been around Bethlehem and uh, and shepherds still are. And he said it was cold that night. And I remember thinking it must have been so cold for those shepherds and for baby Jesus. And and that's the kind of reality that you're talking about that I it was so exciting for me to, to think that my son, who was um, eight at the time, can still as you say, feel what it would have felt like for the Savior. So, and maybe that's a good place to start. There's a lot of questions about uh, time of year. I know most members of the church uh, would say that it was uh, in the springtime in April. And I didn't tell you that I was going to ask you about this, but hopefully you're okay if we talk about it a little bit. But um, I know you've argued, and I'm fairly convinced. I mean, I'm, I'm 
I'm a little bit agnostic as in, okay, if I find out it's a different time, fine with me. But uh, but I'm fairly convinced uh, that you're correct that probably was Decemberish. So I don't know, may, maybe you can walk us through that a little bit. Well, I've, I've been working with this for literally decades. And um, when, when you and I were together uh, a dozen years ago on one of our assignments in Jerusalem, uh, I released an article through uh, BYU Studies titled uh, Dating the Birth of Jesus Christ. And boy, did it, it did it get the email because yeah. in the article we lay out all of the evidence uh, that suggests that Jesus has to have been born in early winter, um, and, and this would mean um, and the early winter directly preceding uh, Herod's death. King Herod died in in April of four BC, and uh, all of the evidence points to December of 5 BC, possibly the first couple of days of January, but most likely late December as the time when Jesus was born uh, in Bethlehem. And this accords with the general Christmas season that we celebrate, but it's way out of accord with uh, Brother Talmadge's model in Jesus the Christ that Jesus was born on April 6th of the year 1 BC uh, for a variety of reasons uh, that very popular notion among Latter-day Saints just doesn't stand up to any of the historical or even archaeological uh, evidence that we have for the for the accounts in, in Matthew and Luke. Uh, for one thing, Herod died in 4 BC, so Jesus can't be born three years later in 1 BC, because Jesus is born in the days of Herod the Great, what Matthew 2 says. And uh, uh, in terms of the, the timing several other constraints including book of mormon evidence this was one of the most important things is that the book of mormon gives us very clear timing clues uh, for some of the things in the life of christ and one of them is the date of his birth uh, at least the, the general uh, uh, time and, and we can fix this now i'll invite people to read the study if they'd like because it's quite long yeah, but we can date this to uh, to December of five BC, which interestingly enough was the date preferred by uh, President J. Reuben Clark in his masterful treatment of, uh, of the New Testament called Our Lord of the Gospels, which was a priesthood manual in the nineteen fifties. He wrote that, of course, three decades after Elder Talmadge published his work, Jesus the Christ. But uh, this was an important thing to me that that President J. Reuben Clark felt um, total freedom to differ with Elder Talmadge in his understanding of when Jesus was born. And uh, uh, President Clark had said, I'm just taking the very best scholarship that I can find. And to me, it points to 5 B.C. December. So taking that as kind of a uh, a license to go ahead and explore this further, I did lots of historical and, and other research, and all of it pointed to December of 5 BC. And so that's the conclusion that you would see, uh, well supported, I might add, if you were to read the article Dating the Birth of Jesus Christ from the December 2010 BYU study. I think and then you had a follow up one like a, a year or two later, right? Uh, well, we got some we got some uh, feedback on that. And so uh, because of the feedback and, and the natural questions that arose, I did another study, uh, which was published in 2015, called Dating the Death of Jesus Christ, which maybe we ought to come back and talk about in, in May or June, because we'll be good. ready to, to look at the end of the Savior's mortal ministry at that time. But uh, yeah, and then subsequently we did one called uh, Dating the Departure of Lehi from Jerusalem. BYU Studies called these a trilogy of dating studies. <laughs> you can release them as an ebook with Deseret, so you can buy that and get all three articles together. But uh, yeah, I've, uh, I've, I've kind of become a, a, a dating guru, if you will, and, and not in the sense that any young people are interested in dating, but uh, yeah. <laughs> in the sense that we who love the scriptures and, and love to answer as many questions as you can, uh, uh, explore those things. So yeah, uh, I'm happy to say that uh, 
for me, the December period is uh, is is the time of the birth of the Savior, and that makes my Christmas season bright. Uh, I don't I don't find myself having to justify and say, well, we know he wasn't born this time of year. We know he was born more in the spring. No, I, I'm, I'm certain he was born at this time of year. And that leaves spring all alone for the Easter tradition, which I love uh, maybe just a, a little bit more. Yeah. Very good. And and as I said, I find the, uh, the evidence fairly convincing. So, Well, you know, a lot uh, of academics in the church have over over the decade as they've looked at these things. I, I think some of them slowly and maybe, uh, you know, uh, barking a little bit along the way have, have finally concluded that the evidence is 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 solid that uh, that Jesus was born at this time of year. And that has nothing to do with the the uh, adoption of uh of a Roman holiday in the fourth century and the fixing of Jesus' birthday to December 25th. That that doesn't bother me. I don't know what day of December Jesus was born. No. Um, other than I think it's very likely um, uh, that it would be late in the, um, in the ninth month of the Jewish year. Uh, that, that is to say, the third month of the Jewish year, if you count the way that it was counted in the New Testament era, the yeah. month that he slept. Uh, and this goes back then to the to the story of the Annunciation and the timing of the Annunciation in Luke 1 to, to Mary. But in any case, uh, that would generally put Jesus' birth date somewhere mid to late December. Yeah. Well, speaking of that and your, your trilogy uh, that you put together, I know you've had... Uh, Another book uh, that uh, explores some of the realities kind of based on uh, archaeology uh, of uh, but also on, on other things, not just archaeology um, of the the birth narrative uh, and the wise men and so on. I, I think your book is called Stone Manger, that it's available as a Kindle app. I think I've, I've, I've got right. it. I've read it a number of times. Right. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm I'm actually holding up my Kindle right here. I don't know if you can oh, see yeah. that very well. It? Yeah, a little uh, bit of a reflection, but there uh, we go. Let me just see if I hold oh, there it. There you go, Stone Manger. Yeah, there That's it is. And I recognize that. I think I was with you when you took that picture, actually, but maybe not. But I I've been with you when you've taken a picture like that. Well, um, I took that picture. I think in '93 or '4, so it's oh, okay. possible. It's possible you were there. That's actually a, a manger from Megiddo. Yeah, yeah. No, I've uh, I've been and, with um, you looking at that manger. So. In, in the second in the second edition, I put many other pictures of mangers, stone mangers from all over the country, uh, and the, the cover of the of the uh, 2022 edition, which I released in PDF to friends and family, shows one from Sephoris there uh, <laughs> that we like. But yeah, that's what a manger looked like. It was made of stone, not wood, and as I was thinking, I'd like to talk about Christmas from an archeological perspective. Um, I decided as an archeologist to, to use the one artifact that's actually mentioned in the Luke 2 story. You know, a stable is not mentioned. And I don't even think Jesus was born in a stable. Um, uh, there's no uh, animals mentioned at present at the at the nativity. I mean, we talk about shepherds abiding by their flocks, but they would not have brought those flocks with them to Bethlehem. Yeah. Uh, and there may have been a, a donkey and, and maybe a goat for milk, but I, I don't think that those play a role in the story other than answering why Joseph and Mary would have a manger present. But um, the only the only artifact, you know, a hard artifact in that story in Luke 2 is the manger. Yeah. To me, we can we can start with that and, and start to tell the realia of the story. And so I wrote this book, um, and I decided I would call it the Archaeology of Christmas. And, uh, thought, <laughs> There's a catchy well, title, I tell you. Yeah. Read a book called The Archaeology of Christmas. And now I've decided maybe they would, but uh, <laughs> but uh, it occurred to me. Well, let's just call it Stone Manger from the one artifact that we can talk about that. We'll start with that and explain how many things that we have traditionally thought about Christmas aren't the way that the real first Christmas would have been. Um, and one of those would be the manger. It's not a wooden feed box filled with hay. 
it's made of stone because that's what everything was made of in the Holy Land. And, and we find literally hundreds and hundreds of these stone uh, troughs anywhere we're at in all ages, not just in the New Testament era, but going back way into the Old Testament era and moving forward from the New Testament through the Byzantine and Islamic times and, yeah, and even and Crusader until pre-modern times. Uh, when they invented, you know, uh, plastic troughs for animals, and what was a what was a a, a trough used for? The Greek term in Luke two is fatne, and it does mean uh, a trough that's used for uh, 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 animals. But in this case, uh, it, 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 in the Holy Land, it, it, they were used for water. Mm -hmm. um, on occasion, if if uh, horses were stabled, uh, like in Megiddo, they might also have used them for food, for, for uh, some type of feed. But uh, mostly what people did and what anyone like Joseph and Mary would have done with the animal or two they owned was graze them uh, abroad because grass grows all year long. You know, you've been there in the winter. You've been in Bethlehem and there's green grass in the fields. Yeah, It doesn't snow there. Uh, in in any great amount, and on those rare occasions when it does, it melts in a day. Uh, yeah. The winters there are more like Southern California than they are here in Utah, so it's 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 not terribly freezing cold. It rarely freezes, and it's it's a it's a much more Mediterranean climate, and so grass grows in the winter, and even though it goes brown in the summer, it's always available. We we always say there's two seasons in Israel: green and brown. Right? Yeah. The green grass of the winter and the brown grass of summer. But uh, animals could go out uh, all year round and just graze. So no one grew hay, really, yeah. uh, animals during the winter. And there wouldn't have been any hay or feed uh, necessary for Joseph and Mary's donkey and, and goat. Uh, it, it would have been a, a water trough. Uh, because one thing that animals can't do is draw water from a spring or a well. You have to have a trough for them uh, in order to put water in it too, so they can drink. And that's what a stone manger would have been used for as, as, as a water manger. So it's highly unlikely that there was any hay in the manger that Jesus was laid in. We simply read in Luke 2 that he was wrapped in, in swaddling clothes, which basically means he was wrapped in what we would call receiving blankets, you know, wrapped tightly. You know, some people think it's little strips like he was mummified, but this is, uh, this is not the way that it was. This is the way we wrap babies. We swaddled them tightly and laid right there in a stone manger, which was very solid and not going to be tipped over whatsoever, uh, just the right size and uh, a, a beautiful you know, setting to, to think of. There's an artist, by the way, that I want to do a, um, a, a little plug for. Her name is Jenity Page. Oh, I know Jenity well. And Jenity has painted. I've, I've, I've actually taken her to Israel to paint. So <laughs> I, she has painted a baby in a stone manger. And uh, on her website, she actually attributes the idea to uh, to our, our book, The Stone Manger. And uh, yeah. uh, she called me and asked what it would look like. And by the time she's done her beautiful painting, which I think is called Little Lamb, uh, uh -huh. jenity.com, you can, you can get that. It's a very beautiful picture of, of the, the infant Christ in, in a stone manger. No hay, just swaddled and lying in the manger, exactly as the shepherds then would find him having sought that sign in the middle of the night in December in Bethlehem. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, and I want to plug Genity as well. I think she really tries to get her, her details accurate and great person, great artist. And Oh, she's a wonderful uh, artist. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it does good stuff. Well, thank you. So maybe we could even back up a little bit and talk about even the reason for coming to Bethlehem, which I know you and I don't hold to the typical story. And, and I think I, I have some of my own speculations that may even go beyond what uh, what you have thought of or not. I don't know. Um, but why don't you talk to us about uh, the the taxation as uh, is usually referred to and the trip to Bethlehem. And we'll, we'll just keep moving from there into stables right. and whatever else. Well, um, the, the first thing maybe to say, even before that is, 
yeah, my, my brain is way beyond anything I've written. So I'm on the same track as you there. There's a, there's 500 things I think about this that yeah. you just have to put in a book. Um, but you have to go back to Luke 1 and Matthew 1 to put together the reason for going to Bethlehem. And we could state that very quick, quickly because you've covered Luke 1 and Matthew 1 in an earlier uh, podcast. But just to... Uh, to revert to that, um, in Luke 1, Mary is visited by Gabriel, who tells her that she will become uh, the mother of the Son of God. And the way that it reads in Luke 1 is kind of important to, to get. So I'm just going to go back to Luke 1, verse 31, where the angel tells her, Thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a child. She'll call his name Jesus, but that's a prescribed name, meaning salvation, right? Yeshua. 32, he shall be great. He shall be called the son of the highest. And that we would understand as being the son of God the Father, as we see later on in verse 35. The power of the highest shall overshadow thee, and that would enable Mary to have the child. But in verse 32, it goes on to say, the Lord shall give unto him the throne of his father, David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And that means he's going to be the Messiah. Yeah. He's going to be the, uh, the king of the line of David that would become the, the great anointed king promised all through Isaiah. So Mary knows after the visit of the angel, and she's a young lady. I, I think she's, you know, 17. Um, uh, but whatever her age was, uh, she knows uh, that she's going to have a child who will be the son of God. What she doesn't know about that is how will that be possible? You know, uh, how is this going to happen? Seeing I know not a man, I'm a, I'm a good girl. I've never had the relations that would lead to coming forth of a child. Right. So uh, the angel explained to her in verse 35, the power of the highest shall overshadow the uh, the Holy Spirit will come upon thee to enable that. And as a result of, of the mystery of that, you'll be enabled to bring forth the Son of God. Um, I'm very careful the way that I discuss that because uh, I don't think that involves any mechanics that we would normally imagine in terms of bringing forth uh, a child. Uh, I think this truly was a virgin birth in the, in the purest sense of the word. And um, I have no problem in this case imagining that God could enable a young woman to bring to become uh, uh, enabled to, to bear a child without any sexual contact. Right, I'm right. absolutely certain that, that that's the way and, and not the way some other people, you know, well, the people in the church have, have modeled it in the past. Uh, Right. Uh, I think this truly was a miraculous uh, and and virgin birth. But but going back to that, that's the part she couldn't possibly understand. But what she could understand is he'd be the son of David. He would be the Messiah. So she knows all the important material there is to know about this. Now, go back to uh, 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 Joseph's story in Matthew 1. Joseph, four months later, when uh, Mary returns from uh, from Jerusalem, from, from Judea, and is found with child in Matthew. Yeah. Joseph's um, about ready. Uh, well, he knows it's not his child. <laughs> That's a, a difficult thing for him. Uh, they have been probably for a pretty, pretty close to a year uh, betrothed. And that was a very serious contract. It was actually like marriage part one and marriage part two. The betrothal actually was a marriage ceremony. So it was kind of the proto ceremony. And then and, and a very serious contract, a very serious contract. It was considered a marriage. Yeah. Uh, but then the marriage number two, which is actually the, the uh, conclusion of the contract where the couple then goes to live together and consummate the marriage. That's that hadn't happened yet. And, and that, that would be happening. And, and about the time they're ready to do that, you know, Mary's discovered with child, probably in her mid second trimester. And he, he's not the father. And so he's going to cancel the, uh, the, uh, the marriage. 
And, and this uh, is one of the few legitimate reasons to be able to do that. Yeah. Well, b- because because he knows it's not his child. He must yeah. have been heartbroken. Yeah. Um, and then comes the revelation, right, in Matthew 1, uh, by the angel, Joseph, fear not to marry Mary, because that which is in her is, is from God, and and she'll bear a son, and you call his name Jesus. I like that because because... With that statement in Matthew 1, God, through the angel, is assigning Joseph the fatherhood role yep. in reality to Jesus. For Joseph to be told, you shall call his name Jesus, means Joseph will preside at the bar mitzvah eight days after Jesus is born. And will give the name Jesus, right? It was prescribed to Mary, so she knows what the name must be. And now when Joseph will know what the name must be, when they put their stories together, that'll be the hook. They'll all know that they've had revelation from the same source. And and, and Joseph now knows he's going to be the father of that child. Now, this is going to be an unusual situation for him. But if it's a revelation, you do it, right? But that becomes tricky for both of them, because if he's not putting her away, I I mean, I just put myself in the shoes of Mary and of Joseph. And to be a a young girl in a very small, very conservative town where everybody knows everybody and everybody knows everybody's business and they're very conservative. And to be a young girl who's pregnant out of wedlock, that's devastating. Yeah. And for Joseph to marry her is essentially to say, oh, yeah, that was me. Yep. That's exactly right. They yep, both but, know they're innocent and pure, but they're thrust into a situation by the Lord uh, yeah, yeah. of having to endure uh, a a false reputation, which is that yeah, they, yeah. Had, they had they uh, had been sexually active before their marriage, and that's just sometimes you know there's a burden to bear in yeah, doing yeah. great service, and for them this was a difficult one. But you know, you know the excitement they must have had at knowing. Uh, what this was would have made it uh, a joy at the same time. One of the things that Joseph didn't know, at least it, it's not in Matthew 1 that the angel told him this, is that this child would have the throne of David. What the angel tells Joseph in Matthew 1 is that the child is from God and to marry Mary, which it says he does right away. And what I assume from that is that uh, the the time for the uh, uh, conclusion of the betrothal was at hand, right? Okay. And so he um, he marries her on schedule, which was going to be right away, and because uh, uh, he goes right out and does it, it says, but he doesn't know that this child is going to be the Messiah. Yeah. And, and Mary perhaps tells him, but uh, well, I'm sure. You know, I mean, if 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 all of a sudden Joseph says, "Oh, Mary, I know this wasn't anything you did wrong," Mary says, "Oh, Joseph, I'm so relieved." And as this new young couple, uh, especially after they're married, um, uh, speak about their revelation and their excitement of being together, because you know, obviously, they've been preparing for this for a long time. And yeah. now it's happened, and, and but she's four or five months along. Uh, but as she's sharing with him information, and he's sharing with her, they realize there's one thing that he didn't know that she does. And that is that this child will be the Messiah. And that is what sends him to Bethlehem. Because Joseph knows, because any man of Israel knew, um, that that the Messiah must be born in Bethlehem. That's Micah 5, 2. Yeah. That, that's an issue in the next chapter, in, in chapter 2 of Matthew, that yes. Micah 5, 2 tells you that any person uh, of any modest scriptural understanding, and Joseph would have been such a man, would know that that uh, this the Messiah has to be born in Bethlehem. And and. For, for Joseph now and Mary, they knew exactly what they had to do. They had to move to Bethlehem and be known as residents of Bethlehem. Yep. And I'm going to take that, uh, I'm going to speculate just a step further, because well, I, I, I agree. I think, I mean, we can't know for sure, but 
I, I, it's hard for me to see it any other way than they, they say, okay, wait, if he's going to be the Messiah, okay, we got to do this. But I think there's an added bonus because they can move to Bethlehem and they don't have to say when they were married or anything along those lines. And that gives Jesus the chance to grow up in Bethlehem without the stigma of uh, yeah. being a child out of wedlock. Be, right? being, known, being known as a mamzer, right? That's right. Being known as a child born, out, born or conceived at least out, out of, of wedlock. Wedlock. Yeah. Um, but, so I think that's uh, an added advantage to I, I think there are several reasons for them to move to Bethlehem. And and, and I, I could be wrong, but just if I put myself in Joseph's situation and I think of of my wife is in Mary's situation and I think of the child coming, I would do that. I'd say, totally, let's move. totally agree. Yeah. I mean, even even if they didn't. Didn't have the Messiah, they, they might have wanted to move somewhere else, you know, just because yeah, yeah. a little village like that, you know, and. Oh it's yeah, tough. okay, Joseph. We know you did that, Mary. We know. By and Jesus way, would have I'm paid sure, a price. I'm sure they weren't the only young couple that wound up getting married because a, a young woman was yeah. found yeah. pregnant. Okay, we kind of idealize the times of the past, but humans are humans, and this yeah. stuff yeah. happened. And the law of Moses accommodated it. Okay, uh, society accommodated. They didn't stone everybody to death over this stuff. These were family people. These these were loved ones, yeah. but it would have been a social burden to bear. And by leaving Nazareth, at least that was the plan, uh, that social burden uh, won't be with him in Bethlehem. Yeah. But, uh, but of course, it doesn't work out and they wind up back in Nazareth anyway. Uh, that's the that's the way things go. But yeah, that's where you can jump to Luke 2 then, uh, Carrie, and you see um, that well, I, I guess we better start from the beginning because this entire four or five verses here of Luke 2 are almost universally misunderstood. Yeah. Um, and it's because of past commentaries and commentaries written by well-meaning people in the 1800s that wound up being used by well-meaning Latter-day Saints in the 1900s. And so we get lots of less than stellar commentary about what happened here so and i think there are also some translation issues that have caused us some difficulty well sure but i mean we fix those but then we model what we fixed incorrectly sometimes yeah yeah so the first thing that we fixed is that in verse one the decree was not that the world should be taxed okay mm -hmm. the uh word there and it's corrected even in our lds edition footnotes is enrolled or registered. And yeah. the way that this should really be, it, it, it's apographi, which, it, which is to be registered, right? Yeah. To, be, to be put on a list of who lives where. Yep. Um, and this was uh, a thing that, that uh, Caesar, the first emperor, right? uh, uh, Caesar Augustus, that is to say, not Julius Caesar, but Caesar yeah. Augustus, the first empire guy, um, uh, set for his empire that there would now be a law that required enrollment in your city or within the environs that your city was the center of. Everybody in the empire had to be registered in terms of where they live. This um, verse two is an aside, by the way. It says this registration was proto uh, uh, Quirinius being governor of Syria. Um, that doesn't mean first made. It means that this decree was made before Kyrgyz oh, yeah. was governor of Syria. And that's a thing that's misunderstood by scholars, but I'm not going to argue that here or there because it's not important to our audience. Uh, what it means is that it's not a census that's being taken. It's a registration in place that is a law in the empire in perpetuity. And by the way, that... Roman Empire tradition of registering people endured down in Europe forever. It, yeah. it, it down and it became a part of, of 800 years later, the Holy Roman Empire, and it became a part of all European tradition to this day. If you live in Europe, if you live in the EU, you have to be registered in the city where you live. One of the things that astonished me uh, as a missionary in the mid seventies in Germany is that I had to register with the government 
Uh, and it wasn't just me. It was anyone living in Germany, whether you were a German citizen or whether you were an expatriate. You had to, if you came into a city and were going to reside there, you had to register with that city's registration authority. We called it Anmeldung in German. And then if you moved from that city to another city, you had to unregister in one city and re-register in another city. You had to do Abmeldung in, say, Hamburg, and then you had to do Anmeldung, which is registration, when you moved to Berlin. And I registered in seven different cities over two years in Germany because that was the law. And that law goes back to Caesar Augustus, at least the beginnings of that tradition. So it's and, and it has a census like quality in that so it's not a census, but it it performs some of the same things. This is how they're going to know who they should tax. Uh, yeah. and 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 the population the centers and right. so on like that, right? I so mean, it, it, it accomplishes it, that, but it's also how you get you know, people will hear. It, it's uh, how you get population. It's how they knew their population. You simply add up who's on the roll and you, you've got it. You don't need to go and count people like we do in the United States because we don't have a national uh, or we say we don't have a national registration. Uh, somehow, I think the IRS knows where I am. But yeah. Uh, yeah. in any case, we have a census because we specifically don't register people. But yeah. Yeah. Europe does. And, and that's why, you know, this registration was not a census. This is before the, the, um, the census that was taken by Quirinius, which was a provisional census taken in AD 6. Right? Uh, this was registration in place to your city. And you see that as you go into verse 3. All went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Registration was connected to city. And so you read in verse four, Joseph went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth, which basically means that he would have unregistered out of Nazareth and uh, into Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David. That line confuses people, but come to the next line in verse five to be registered with Mary, his espoused wife, being raped with child. Now, notice that it says his espoused wife. That means that the second marriage ceremony has happened, the one that closes the betrothal. So they're married. She is his spouse now, not his fiance, if we use the word. Uh, and they are going to be registered together. And she has a child. And that means that when that child is born, it too will be registered as a resident of Bethlehem. And that's the plan. Yep. A, a native of Bethlehem, right? That's the that's the whole idea. And it, it says specifically in verse 5, to be registered. Joseph goes there and Mary go there with that purpose, to be registered as residents of Bethlehem. So that when that child is born, it will be known that he is born in Bethlehem. This is a young couple understanding what prophecy requires and taking the initiative to bring it about. There was nothing, um, uh, they were not victims of circumstances, what I like to say about it here. But there were no Roman soldiers forcing them to go to Bethlehem to pay their taxes, okay? In fact, there were no Roman soldiers stationed in Judea yeah. or Galilee yeah. in that period. Uh, I read a book ago, a while ago, by a, uh, a, a rather famous LDS writer that talked about the the Tenth Legion being in in uh, the Holy Land at the time of Jesus' birth. And no, it wasn't. It, <laughs> there were no Roman legions whatsoever. Herod controlled the place, and he had his own military and security forces. Uh, and yes, it was a province of Rome, but he was a client king, and his forces were his own. There yep. were no yep. Roman soldiers there, and they weren't dressed in red with those big shiny helmets, and the movies are all wrong. Um, and there wasn't any soldier going in saying you have to move to to this other city where your ancestors were to be taxed because that's the silliest uh yeah. you know, the scholarly tradition we have is that somehow the jews had a deal with the romans that they could be taxed in the country of the in the city of their ancestors uh, and that's this the is, dumbest taxation idea ever 
you well, don't I mean, want who, to... who would do that? Nobody would, yeah. nobody would go and nobody would pay. It would be impossible to enforce. And yeah, that's, that's the way all, to get the least amount of tax money possible. <laughs> the, the, the New Testament tells you that there are publicans in every town, right? Yeah. Which means they tax on site. They don't yeah. send you to places 200 or 100 miles away to be taxed. You're taxed on site, which is the way any government does it. Yeah, no, so you don't want to, to ha take the chance that someone does or doesn't show up in the right city to be taxed. They you tax them where go, they are. Yeah, they weren't victims of circumstance. They weren't forced by Rome to go to um, to Bethlehem to pay taxes. And they they didn't have to go to Bethlehem to be enrolled in a census because because this was a registration by city. It wasn't a one time census. And, and so all of those things we say about this passage uh, traditionally, and by the way, they're in the manuals, unfortunately, uh, are not correct. Uh, this is Joseph and Mary, this incredibly faithful young couple, thrust by the Lord's plan into a, a difficult situation. Yeah, with, a really tough situation. She is pregnant before their marriage, but they, they accept it. They're faithful. They they have initiative. They're what the Doctrine and Covenants calls anxiously engaged. Yeah. And this would be in more ways than one, in a good cause. And they marry and they move to Bethlehem on purpose to be registered in Bethlehem so that child would be born in Bethlehem. And that's then what verse 7 goes on to say. While they were there, she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in, in receiving blankets, swaddled him, and laid him in a manger of stone. Yeah. Because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, if I could just talk about the inn for a minute. Yeah. If, if, before you do that, can I touch on one uh, thing? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go back. Earlier, and then let's go back to the end. But, uh, and this is just a personal thing for me, and I know for my wife as well. She's talked about this. Um, that that There's a phrase that just has come to mean so much to me, and it's it's after Mary says, you know, how can this be seen? I know not a man. And the angel says, well, the, the power of the highest will overshadow you. And Mary has to think in her mind, okay, I will become pregnant, and it will be from God, and no one is going to believe that. And most likely Joseph, I mean, Joseph's not going to believe it. My parents, no one's going to believe it. So I will live with this stigma my entire life. The child will live with this. She has to think most likely no, Joseph's not going to marry her, and so probably no one's going to marry her. But, but whether she thinks maybe someday or not, I don't know. She knows that she's going to pay a price for this. That she she has to know there's a price to be paid, and she still says, "Behold the handmaid of the Lord," which, in other words, we could state as saying, "Thy will be done." This is this will be tough, but Thy will yeah. be done. And I do not think it's a coincidence that the Savior, who will say, "Not my will, but Thy will be done," is born of a mother who, in essence, said the same thing. As she said, behold, the handmaid of the Lord and just said, OK, this is going to be tough. But if that's what you're asking, then that's what I'm doing. You know, this is uh, this is this is so true. And it, it may be that perhaps some of the layers of what you've described come upon her one after the other rather than all at once. But yeah, yeah, over, it could be over a period of time. All of these things and more, you know, uh, the disappointment of Joseph that she anticipates will be there. Uh, the difficulty of uh, having to raise a child alone. Yeah. Uh, and, and I don't suspect really, to be honest with you, that Mary would necessarily have known that, that her child needed to be born in Bethlehem. Um, I don't know. Men were not as present in the synagogue for scripture readings as men were. Right. And, and they didn't have the, the, the kind of uh, scripture schooling that went right. along with that. Micah, by the way, was one of the prophets that was read in the synagogue uh, as a haftarah. And um, we're not entirely sure of timing, but if timing uh, then was anyway reflective of timing that's come down through, through centuries, uh, Micah was a summertime reading. And if Mary was, uh, uh, was uh, enabled to bear the child, say, in late March, as I think she was, uh, then four and a half months later is summer, and uh, the reading of Micah might even have been fresh in Joseph's mind. Mm -hmm. uh, in any case, uh, it's it's uh, it's when you get those two together, and they are exchanging their feelings and their fears, their worries, but also their relief 
that at least you know at Someone least else. they know what's really yeah. happened. Uh, it, boy, the love and the bind, uh, the the bounds of love that are created there is amazing. You know, just before we do the end, one of the things people maybe should understand about Luke one and Luke two. And, and Matthew 1 and Matthew 2, is it, now putting aside Zacharias and John the Baptist, and putting aside Jesus at 12 years old, which is in Luke 2, the nativity story is a Joseph and Mary story. Yeah. They're the actors. They're the ones highlighted. Jesus is, of course, the center of it all, but he's not the earthly actor here. No, he's That's passive there, yeah. yeah. He, he's passive in this. Um, this is a story of these two young people, a young couple, getting married and becoming servants of the Lord in the most unique and trying way many, maybe any young couple ever has. If there was ever a model for a newlywed couple, it's the nativity story. Yeah. If understood in its context, don't you think? Yeah, no, I, I have so much respect for Joseph and Mary. So much respect for them. You know, you and I have been to that to that compound in Nazareth where the Church of the Annunciation is. It's yeah. beautiful, it's a beautiful Roman Catholic church built in 1964. Uh, biggest church in the Middle East is one of my very favorite places to visit because of its artistic renditions of, of Mary and the child Christ. And, uh, you know, we've had some great times there together. Um, and then we always go over to the Church of St. Joseph. Yes. And, uh, how appropriate that right there next to the church that honors Mary, the mother of the Son of God, uh, is the a church uh, with, with, that honors Joseph. And in there, there's a beautiful painting uh, of, of Joseph teaching Jesus actually acting as the father and teacher. Now, teaching in wood carpentry, which is not what Joseph did and not what yeah. Jesus did. They were stonemasons, but that's a, but it's a beautiful notion that you have a church building there that, that honors Joseph as well as one that honors Mary. And there's that beautiful, you've seen it, statue of the Holy Family, uh, Joseph and Mary and Jesus, right there on the yeah. exterior of that church, That a picture of which hangs in my living room. Oh. Hangs in my living room uh, because uh, I love that notion of the Holy Family. Anyway, it's just a it's just a great model, I think, and it's a story about Joseph and Mary. That's that's the that's the thing in the whole four Gospels that's not like all the others, right? That old song, one of these things, is not yeah. like the nativity <laughs> story, highlights the faith of two, you know, young human beings, a man and a woman, uh, marrying and doing you know, exactly what they should yeah. i think it's i think it's the absolute part i agree and now please join us for part two of this episode where we continue the conversation <laughs>